Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to do something for me? Can you put up your hands if you believe that in schizophrenia symptoms do not, do not cause violence? Oh, I can go home. Yeah. <laughs> no scratching your head. Um, so I'm assuming you all do. So we are, well, we don't have to give our talk. But actually, you'd be surprised how much research literature is out there that apparently demonstrates exactly that. I'm going to talk a bit about that and talk about a field which I think had gone dead, essentially, and uh, which is beginning to have a bit of a revival. So what I'm going to talk about is a bit about this renaissance of research um, in this field, the key importance that we believe of delusions. The other thing is, just if you just look at the words, you know there's a difference between causing something and predicting something, but you'd be amazed how confused those two notions are in much of the research literature in this field. You might even begin to start questioning why you're filling in HCR 20s. Certainly <laughs> people aren't going to be discharged over the next five years, and whether they have any bearing whatsoever on um, pre preventing violence. But that's a different talk. The other thing that we'll finish on implications for clinical practice. So it seems to me that, that you know, I think about a golden age, uh, a golden age of the sort of 70s and the 80s, and John Gunn is on his throne in, as professor of forensic psychiatry at the Institute. Pamela Taylor is his clinical research fellow, doing, uh, looking, demonstrating the association with uh, delusions and violence in Brixton Prison. Um, Herr Professor Hafner has published his textbook um, in demonstrating that um, there's a strong association in Germany, later to teach uh, Dr. Ulrich. Um, and in general, patients, in my experience, tell me it's because of their delusions. But you'd be surprised uh, how little evidence there seems to be subsequent to this sort of rather golden era when I was a young trainee. So I think what then happens, you've got Right about that time, there's um, threat control override. Um, and then that is generally refuted in subsequent research. It seems to be, for some reason or other, that no longer in favour. What actually happens, and I blame uh, MacArthur for this. MacArthur, the, probably the finest, and, but also, I think, in some ways flawed. And certainly the most expensive study in risk ever carried out for $7 million has a legacy in some areas, I think, of getting it wrong and actually sending us down the wrong path. And so certainly it wasn't just um, Applebaum's work, but others in Germany as well, actually showing that there was no association with threat control override. Those original studies were from cross-sectional surveys, the Washington Heights survey um, in New York, showing this, 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 Id this notion that the rationality in the midst of irrationality, that threat control override could actually cause appeared, certainly was associated with violence. You then get, I mean, whilst pointing the finger at poor John Milton and, and Kimberly Dean, we, we, we have to become clean and say, you know, some, we had a first episode psychosis cohort in which we couldn't find any associations at all with positive symptoms measured on the scan and violent behaviour. But we were doing it wrong. And, we'll, and Simona will explain to you in a moment what we, why we got it wrong. So you just look boldly, cross-sectionally, at these, these associations. In the first episode, psychosis, no, you can't find any association. Incredibly disappointing. We never published it. Um, the other thing is, and this is still alive and well, the notion that violence is not due to psychosis and psychotic people, it's due to uh, social factors, psychological factors, criminological risk factors, not the psychopathology. So there's a very, very influential uh, meta-analysis in psychological bulletin by Bonter and colleagues. And then more recently, L. Bogan and Johnson study, about 40,000 um, people in the USA being interviewed and finding once you do adjustments, so you, in fact, he didn't even find an association, unadjusted. But once he um, adjusted for all these other criminological factors, it got even less and less. And then, very important, I put it in capital letters, Applebaum study. This is enormously influential. I remember reading this, and it's in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Applebaum was later the president of the American Psychiatric Association. It's based on the, the MacArthur study. 
And what they show is, in, in, actually it's a very, very fine study, methodologically. So I, one of the things I would argue is that many of the studies that we base our conclusion on are methodologically unsound, I mean, truly unsound, to make any conclusions on. This was not a methodologically unsound study. In fact, we use their data, and Simona will describe this. Statistically, it's all wrong. And it's essential to understand the statistics of prediction and the statistics of causation. It's, it took me 10 years, and I still don't understand some of it. So you know, it's been a bit much to try and get that message over. But if you can just remember that and think about that notion of what is causation, what is prediction. And more recently, the notion though it's, you know, there's hardly anything there at all in the psychosis. It's all down to comorbid um, substance misuse, and this must be true because it's based on a huge case register in Scandinavia or a meta-analysis. Actually, it's based on a clinical case register, a lot of that data, or it's based on a lot of studies with poor methodology or poor statistics. Okay, just talk a little bit about re-evaluation of the whole position. Actually, it goes back to 2006, and this was in a, a drug trial, the Katie study, for over 1,000 people with schizophrenia, looking at the PANS, the MacArthur, very fine measure, self-reported or collateral uh, information to measure violence, and they start looking at symptoms. And so they find with persecutory ideation, um, the risk is increased for both minor and serious violence in the study. And they find another interesting finding, which I'm, we're not going to talk about today, but we're currently looking at, is a negative association with negative symptoms in terms of violence. And then more complex statistics looking at interactions between some of the symptoms. So you start, this is probably a very early sort of stage of actually the, a renaissance in thinking about symptoms of psychosis. And actually, when I think about this, often the research is just merely mirroring what you do as a clinician. You can see it yourself. The patients tell you this, but actually the research tells you the opposite. And so I'm trying to, and to me, I think it's been a dark era of sort of results going nowhere and not showing us the true picture. The other key message is it's all about when the symptoms are acute. And what is the most acute phase of all in schizophrenia, psychosis, the first episode. So Nielsen and Large, they do a meta-analysis looking at basically all, it's really simple. All they're doing is looking at the, the homicides during the first episode period, so it's about a year or something like that, or 18 months, compared to the rate of homicide through the rest of the illness career, the psychosis career. And what they actually find is that the rate of homicides in first episode psychosis during the prodromal and the first episode period is 15 and a half times per year more than over the rest of the career. And that's so important. I mean, it, it just, it's the most simple demonstration of acuteness. The other thing you have to think about is change, of course. Change, psychosis comes and goes. It waxes and wanes. It ebbs and flows. It can be on a daily basis. And these are other key issues. And most of our studies are cross-sectional or just look at a snapshot. The other thing was, is actually poor old um, Richard Van Dorn, who we met um, at a conference, he's he sort of talking to him, gave us so many ideas, and he pointed out the key issue about um, the, the temporal association. You have to look at, does the violence occur at the same time as the symptoms? Because if you do a study like a case register, it might have 50,000 patients with schizophrenia, but if you're just looking at lifetime diagnosis and sometime or other violent conviction, you get all sorts of odd, strange findings, like it's all down to comorbidity. And you know, surprise, surprise, he, he's actually reanalyzing L. Bogan and Johnson's data. He can't get his paper in American Journal of Psychiatry. It has to go to you know, less impact. But that is the sort of nature of research. The key message is look at the timing <coughs> of the symptoms. So what we're going to talk about is sort of in the post macarthur era, some new research that, that we've been doing. It's different samples. It's not all um, temporally associated. Some of it's cross-sectional, but some of it is. So the questions are, are delusions the key symptoms? Which delusions? Is the pathway a direct one? Or is it an indirect one? And that's another important issue. 
Is the association causal? Do the symptoms cause, not predict, cause the um, violence? And um, we'll talk a bit about, speculatively, I have to admit, implications for treatment. Simone, you explain this so much better than I do. Thank you. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm talking you through four different studies we've conducted where we investigated um, the association between symptoms of psychosis and violent behavior. And I'm starting to address the so-called rival hypothesis, what Jeremy mentioned, saying that the association between symptoms of mental illness, symptoms of psychosis and violence is completely explained by comorbid um, substance abuse. And as noted, um, Sina Fassel has done quite a substantial um, work on um, this notion, and what he suggests is a mediation model, where when you look at the association between schizophrenia and other psychosis and violence, it is really the substance abuse which drives the association and not um, the psychotic symptoms. So what we've done is we've addressed this first issue in a um, mega-analysis using a huge sample of the general population where we combined seven different um, studies using two household surveys and the second man's modern lifestyle survey with four um, booster samples. And um, it has been recommended that when you look at the association between psychosis and violence, not just only look at a categorical level of diagnosis, because what we do know is that um, a diagnosis of psychosis is quite heterogeneous because it comprises a very broad range of symptoms. So what we did is we did use the PSQ and we had five symptoms of psychosis, which is hypomania, thought insertion, paranoid delusions, strange experiences, and hallucinations, and we also got a categorical diagnosis at a cutoff point of 3 plus, which is a prevalence of 1% in this sample in the general um, population. In the first step, we did look at the association between the categorical clinical diagnosis and the individual symptoms with any violence and subsequent questions ask about the type of violent behavior, the severity, and the victims. And I think this slide is quite impressing because of the lack of association. It's a heavily adjusted model, and we adjust on symptom level for the symptoms each other. It's adjusted for demography and for substance abuse. And what you can see is there's nothing, when you look at a categorical diagnosis um, of psychotic illness with any any um, aspect of violence. The only symptom which does demonstrate an um, association with any violence, with repetition, severity, and certain types of, vic- uh, of victims are paranoid delusions. What we then did is to further investigate the role of comorbidity in the association between symptoms and violence we did stratified analysis. So what we did is, these are our comorbid disorders, and we looked whether the comorbidity, um, the comorbid um, condition was present or not, and looked at the association with violence. The white bars, uh, the bars show you the odds ratios with the confidence intervals, and the white bars are the associations in the absence of the comorbidity, and the black bars um, in the presence of the comorbidity. And the red arrows indicate when a finding is significant. And what you can see is for a PSQ3+, for a categorical diagnosis, you do not have any direct effect of the illness on (coughs) violent behavior, but it's driven by comorbidity and it's anxiety, antisocial personality disorder particularly, and alcohol dependence. When you go through the other symptoms, you can see there's very little, and hypomania, strange experience, hallucinations, completely driven by antisocial personality disorder. Again, it's completely different when you look at the persecutory delusions, the paranoid delusions, is you do have a strong effect of ASPD when the effect is stronger, comorbid with um, the personality disorder, but if you look at the associations in the absence of these comorbid disorders, you do have direct effects. So it's not just the psychopathology which drives the association, but it is the, the symptom per se. It's not in the case of a categorical diagnosis. You really have to look at symptom level to really um, get these associations right. Thank you. 
The next bit what Jeremy mentioned is we know that first episode acute phases of psychosis is the risk of violence is elevated compared to other phases in the illness. So what we used is the prisoner cohort study, which is a prospective longitudinal study of prisoners interviewed shortly before release into the community and followed up after release. They were 18 plus years. We had almost 1,000 people who were follow up, followed up into the community. And they, um, it was um, quite dangerous sample because they, they, had, they served sentences for two plus years for either a violent or a sexual um, index offense. And what we were interested in is, again, in the association between symptoms of psychosis, offending, but elucidating the role of treatment in this, um, in this association. We had three diagnostic categories. We had delusional disorder, we had schizophrenia, and we had drug-induced psychosis. And in the first step, we looked at the association between these three diagnostic categories and violence in the follow-up. And there was no association at all. Then we introduced the treatment variable, which indicated any sort of psychiatric treatment, and um, divided these three diagnostic groups, whether they were treated or untreated. And only in the case of untreated schizophrenia, we did find an association with violence in the follow-up. We next introduced four symptoms, four symptoms of psychosis, and were interested which of these symptoms really account for this association between untreated schizophrenia and violent outcome. And again, it was only the paranoid delusions. And in this mediation model, um, what we found out that if you don't treat a prisoner with schizophrenia, then there's a risk of an increase of a re-emergence of the paranoid delusion. And this, in turn, then is associated with violence. And these findings really emphasize the importance of maintaining treatment in persons with schizophrenia to avoid the reoccurrence of um, paranoid delusions, which then could lead to um, serious violent behavior. The last part. Me uh, Jeremy mentioned it, direct or indirect pathways from delusions to violence. What is a direct pathway? A direct pathway means you have a risk factor which is really related, after controlling for all the confounders, which is really related to your outcome. An indirect pathway is a mediation model where you have an explanatory variable in between, meaning your risk factor is associated with a different factor, which then explains the violent outcome. And this was the first um, papers we did on the association between delusions and violence in a clinical sample. And as Jeremy said, at the beginning, we got it completely wrong. And then came Richard von Dorn, who really sensitized us for this issue of temporal proximity. I will explain that in more detail a bit later. But what we did in this first episode psychosis sample, we looked at the association between a huge range of psychotic symptoms in the past 12 months and violence in the past 12 <coughs> months. What we did find, we find three um, delusions that were significantly associated with serious violence, which were delusions of being spied upon, persecution and conspiracy, all delusions which imply a threat for the person involved. But it was not a direct pathway, because what we also had, or what we also know, is that affective states are extremely important in the association with violent behavior. And we had the Maudsley assessment of delusion schedule, which asks affect due to illusions. And we had anxiety, we had fear, we had anger, we had depression and elation. And we looked at these association. And what came up was that anger was the explanatory variable in the pathway between these three very prevalent delusions and serious violent behavior. So per se, it's not the delusion itself, but it's the affect due to the delusion, which really explained the association with serious violence. And as already stated, this is not in accordance which were, um, with, uh, with what um, MacArthur study told us, that um, there's no association between delusions and violence. And the reason is, when you are interested in the association between dynamic symptoms and violence, what you have to consider, we are not talking about static factors. 
they fluctuate over time. And so does violence. So if you do it as the MacArthur people did it, they looked at delusions occurring in the past 10 weeks and looked at the association with violence in the subsequent 10 weeks. And what happens is um, you just miss it. Because when you go from T0 to T1, you can see there were no delusions at T0, but um, violence T1. And the next step, it's the other way around. Whereas when you look at temporal proximity, so really considering 10 weeks, was there violence, were there delusions, when you look at this association, then you just get it. And we also had difference to get this paper published. Um, First of all, because we used a more um, sophisticated statistical approach, what we did is we tested the predictive model which was applied in the MacArthur study, and we can confirm delusions do not predict violence. But if you use the temporal proximity, the causal model of the association between delusions and violence, what you do find is that five delusions implying threat to the person are associated with serious violence but only when they make the patient angry. So what we do have here is an almost perfect replication of our first episode psychosis sample, indicating that anger due to the, due to the illusions is the most important variable in the pathway towards serious violence. So what does this mean for clinicians? Um, well, I think what it means is if you're doing an assessment, I mean, actually, it could be if you're doing a forensic assessment of somebody on remand charged with murder. Um, you need to look at certain, ask yourself or ask the patient certain questions. You need to say, well, actually, are the delusions currently present or intense, or were they present and intense at the time? Um, is there any evidence they were present and intense at the time of the offence? You need to look at the content. Is it are they persecuted? Are they spied upon? Conspiracy plotted again, so they're being followed. Do they feel that, you know, here we are, threat control override, it's back again. Are they under the control of a person or force? But most importantly, do, they, do these delusional beliefs make the patient angry? I mean, you could be a junior doctor. Perhaps your junior doctor needs to be taught this if they're being called to a, uh, a casualty department or uh, they used to have an emergency clinic once upon a time in the Maudsley, but somewhere like that where you see acute cases and you may, you may be required to make the decision of compulsory admit or not. Well, if they're angry because of the delusions, probably you should. It's not easy, actually. It's not quite so simple. My experience clinically is that sometimes the patient is murderously angry, um, but actually they won't admit to it. Or um, you may need to explore that. Or they don't look very angry, but my goodness me, they are. But they're planning something, maybe revenge, Maybe you need collateral information, maybe they've been writing something down, maybe it's on the internet. Um, and of course, you need to plan a management intervention if that's what you're finding, because you might get situations like this. This is Mr. Ho uh, of Korean descent, um, and this is before he slaughtered a number of individuals in a, in a high school, this was actually a university killing. Um, you vandalized my heart, raped my soul, torched my conscience, you thought it was one pathetic, um, boy's life you're extinguishing. Thanks to you, I die like Jesus Christ to inspire generations of the weak and the defenseless people. Do you know what it feels like to be spit in your face and to have trash shoved down your throat? Do you know what it feels like to dig your own grave, etc.? Do you know what it feels like to have your throat cut from ear to ear? And he went with his two Glock pistols um, <coughs> and shot uh, a number of um, uh, defenseless individuals before he shot himself. Um, this case is a beauty, really. This is from the New York Post, the eyes of a bus killer. Ever since September, he feels he is being followed by people who are out to get him. But on Friday morning, he decided he'd have enough and that today was going to be the last day that he was going to be fit to feel threatened, which seems to be precisely <laughs> and it's beautiful. Um, and then he shot to death four people on a bus in New York. So. I think that sort of is, is demonstrable evidence of what actually we're showing in, um, in our research. So what does this mean in terms of treatment? I'm so glad we came after the last talk because actually, if you, you know, interlateral thinking, thinking about the clozapine, the whole question here is what do you need to treat 
And I, I don't really know the answer to this for a certain. But it may be, do you treat the delusion or do you treat the anger? Is the anger completely separate from the delusion? I, I don't really know, but maybe it is. Maybe that's why clozapine seems to work. Interesting about personality disorder, whole thing about personality disorder, particularly if they're in clinical samples like insecure hospital samples, they have lots of symptoms. They have other symptoms. Borderline personality disorder is extremely irritable in terms of its symptom profile. Who knows? But the notion, I, I was talking to Neil Boast, who was our clinical director in, um, in Hackney, who was saying, oh, these delusional disorders, this is the whole trouble you see, Jeremy, is they don't respond very well often, you know, they don't, these delusions don't respond. Well, Neil, I could say, maybe it doesn't matter, maybe it doesn't matter if, the, you know, if they're, they're still chronically deluded as long as they're not angry about it, which sort of shut him up for once, but anyway. Um, so may, maybe it's medication for the, the anger um, that you need. Maybe it's CBT, although I suppose, as a psychiatrist, I think, can CBT shift the intensity of that degree of anger to, for, uh, as a result of a delusion? I don't know. Maybe it can. Maybe new techniques are needed. And finally, I suppose this is perhaps going a bit beyond the point, um, but I couldn't resist it. And I think it comes from the CARE study. Um, the notion of what do, we, what do we think we're doing? We are locking up people for huge amounts of time in services. Uh, that may be entirely right to protect the public, but actually does that do anything whatsoever in terms of general prevention? When you have a study which is showing that a large number of, of individuals with schizophrenia are being released from prison every year, um, who nobody knows they've got schizophrenia, nobody's treated them, and they're three times as likely, it's threefold risk, of becoming violent in the next 12 months compared to all other prisoners, certainly in our, our sample. And should, should services, should forensic mental health professionals be doing something about that and intervening somehow to prevent that level of violence being inflicted upon the community? So should prevention be, a term, in terms of symptoms related to violence, be a uh, target for commissioners? Should you have measured outcomes rather than have you, have you ticked the box of your HCR 20 and a, a health of the nation outcome scale being completed every six months to get paid? Um, so that would imply quite a lot of extra work, wouldn't it? Improved screen for schizophrenia to identify these individuals. And then I suppose even more frightening, actually, because I have to say I'm not quite sure how to do this, but the whole implication, one of the things about that's not, that's slightly concealed in those data that Simona was showing you from the cross-sectional survey of those, those, those different surveys, was that the notion of psychosis being a continuum. So most of those individuals where we were picking up those symptoms have no contact with services, or not at the time they were surveyed. And does that mean that out in the community there are individuals with delusional beliefs? Are they people that we see? Are they associated with personality disorder? All these things have service evaluation type implications. Thank you very much.